Yeah, I'm going to be giving an introduction to Risk Five. Um, I was originally giving a talk on eBBF, but then I was more motivated to do this um, because I have currently found like that I have a lot of time on my hands being unemployed. So um, I've been playing around with a lot of hardware, and this seems super cool. Uh, and there's like a Go aspect to it, so just bear with me. Um, so what is Risk Five? Um, so it's a new instruction set architecture. Um, so in order to kind of like explain risk five, I'm gonna like explain what instruction set architectures are. Um, so what is that? Which was the next question. So it's the interface between the software and the hardware. Um, it's really like the interconnect between the two. Um, and then assembly language like comes on top. So it's like the pseudo instructions on top of like the ISA, which is the instruction set architecture. Um, so the one that like most people seem to be familiar with is x86. And this is like one of my favorite Twitter accounts and I'm like kind of mad that I didn't think of it myself, to be honest. So they take the abbreviations of the x86 instructions and then they just like make up things for them. So this one's like automatically do the slightly wrong thing, which is like probably an actual instruction um, based on the behavior of x86. So the other kind of interesting thing about x86 is that like no one really knows exactly how many instructions there are. Like if you get an Intel x86 like manual these days, it's like this big, um, like 5,000 pages. So it's like really unwieldy to deal with, uh, which is kind of where Risk Five comes in. Um, but first, you know, let's go over some of the like differentiating process, like differentiating factors of instruction sets. So um, different processors like can implement the same exact instruction set. So you can have uh, AMD and Intel both implementing x86 and then like ARM will implement ARM um, and stuff like that. So it's kind of just like that interface that you can use, which is cool. Um, and then depending on the vendor, you're gonna get like a different size, it will cost a different amount of money, blah, blah, blah. So the way that you kind of like define the different architectures are based on the complexity of the instruction set. So risk is cool because it's like reduced. It's, you know, a minimal interface. Um, it only implements like what you would like have most of your programs using. And then for everything else that's like kind of complex, it will use like a subroutine. Um, and that has like a trade-off with performance, but it's like those things that you really aren't using and your program might not even need. Um, and then there's the complex instruction sets. And uh, these are like super specific, you know, uh, they have instructions for like literally everything, like, you know, release the bees is like complex. Um, they, they combine a bunch of like different instructions into one and then they also like have the factor of doing memory access and then like computation in the same instruction, which is like a differentiating factor of a complex instruction set versus like reduced. Um, so these are kind of like the two main ones. And like these names weren't even made up until like long after computers existed. So like if you try to figure out like which computer is which one, they're like, well, maybe it was risk or maybe it was not. So like it's not like these terms really define exactly what it is. Um, so like going back ev into even like more like super obscure instruction sets, we have like the very long instruction word and then epic, which is like, very similar, and these uh, run instructions in parallel. So contrary to the two others that we talked about, um, those will run like one instruction, one instruction, one instruction, one instruction, and these will do them in parallel, which is cool, um, but it leaves like a lot of the kind of logic and stuff like that to the compiler versus the hardware, which is also super awesome in a way. It really like depends on what trade-off you need, like everything in computing, it depends on the trade-off. Um, so then there are these two kind of like super obscure ones that like if you look them up like they haven't really been commercialized or anything like that but they're kind of interesting just for the sake of like telling you about them and I thought it was cool. So um, there's minimal instruction set computer and this is like super super small. It has to be anywhere between 32 instructions which if we go back to like you know x86 has somewhere 
around like 2,500. Um, there's this whole talk where this guy tries to reverse engineer like how many instructions there are. And I'm sure that there's like an instruction that's like send data to the NSA or whatever. Um, so this one has 32, which is cool. You can like probably audit them way better. Um, like it will have anywhere between one and 32. But if you have one, then it's called the one instruction set computer. And that's only like one instruction. So like this instruction needs to be like Turing complete, which move is Turing complete. There's like this whole paper on it if you want to read it. Um, and then there's like a bunch of other instructions that you can use, like uh, five different subtractive uh, uh, instructions that will work for this, which is really cool. So like the one instruction set computer, like you're most likely gonna hear about in some sort of like computer science class where they're kind of showing you how to build instructions on other instructions and stuff like that. Uh, but it's still interesting. I mean, it, if you find this interesting, I did enough to tell you about it. So here we are. Um, so one of the things I like really wanted to dive into is like, why did they do this? Like, why did they make a new instruction set? Like here we are in, you know, 2018, they did this like a few years prior though. And it's just like, why are we still coming up with instruction sets? Like why, what did we fuck up so bad that we need a new one, right? Um, and it turns out like a lot, uh, we kind of fucked up a lot. And you know, moving into more modern eras, we need different sets of things. Um, so one of the main things that they really wanted to get with RISC-V was like a free and open instruction set architecture. And like, this is what I really love about this because when you look at kind of the way that computing in general is moving, like everything seems to be like open source. There's even a whole ecosystem nowadays of like open source firmware, which I'll get into a bit later on in this talk. Um, but if we can have almost open source all the way down the stack in computing, it's like we, we have gotten rid of all the proprietary software um, and we have like a fully auditable stack from the bottom up and that is like, Super cool. Um, so even having the open instruction set is awesome. And another like kind of design decision that they made that I really like is the extension. So like they start with like a super, super minimal base of instructions and then you can add on extensions and make your own custom extensions. So it's like fully extendable to whatever vendors want to add whatever crazy ass instructions that their hardware needs, right? So that's super cool. And then if you really want to get into like the nitty gritty here, there's this awesome paper um, on the design of the RISC architecture and uh, they go over like literally everything back to like the PDPs and like why that instruction set was bad. Like they, they really get into the details and like nail every single prior instruction set and say this is why we hate it. Um, and I loved like that part of it because it was like tell me what's wrong and how we messed up and then you know, go back and fix all the problems, which is what this whole paper outlines and it's great. So kind of just to like give you a slight summary, although I can't like do it justice. Um, obviously x86 is like way too complex, like 2,500 instructions. Like we don't even know if it's 2,500. It could be like way more than that. That was just like the last time someone, you know, buzzed it. Um, so ARM is like not open as well. But also, it's still too complex. Like, they have around 600 instructions. Um, and that's just, like, unwieldy, too. It's like, how can everyone keep track of all these instructions, right? Um, Spark is actually kind of cool because when it was under Sun Microsystems, it was an open um, instruction set, which, like, props to Sun for doing that because that's super amazing. But then after they got bought by Oracle, Oracle kind of shut it down. So all the modern versions of Spark are, like, you know, closed off and have a different licensing model. Um, so you can't use the open version of Spark and have it be open, which, you know, like the, the modern version and have it be open and they added like new things that you need for modern computing. Um, so yeah, if you wanna like dive into a bunch of others, definitely check out the paper. So there's like a ton of problems that I've like noticed and just heard about from people that I've asked about proprietary firmware, like I've seen them myself as well. Um, like you'll have a bug in your firmware and like you don't know if it's like a bug in your software or it's a bug in the firmware and you're just like, I know it's not me, like I feel like I checked all my bases, but there is no source for the firmware so you have no fucking clue other than the fact that like I am like 99% sure it's not me but like that 1% is like, eh, 
maybe. Um, so then you like call up the vendor on the phone and you're like, well, I got this bug. And then they're like, no, you're fucking crazy. Um, so it would be like really nice if there was like a definitive way to be like, no, that's you. I see your code right there or whatever. Um, then there's like a bunch of like unneeded complexity in proprietary firmware. Like if you look up how, you know, the Intel uh, management engine works and, you know, all this stuff, like they have a like basic like tools in there that like you would never need, like runtime services. There is like uh, SMM, like updating is actually good. Like we should keep that part, but we should have like auto updating, like every there's whole parts of this firmware that you could just throw in the trash and it's just features that vendors add that like literally no one wants. Um, and it adds more complexity, it adds more bugs. Like these firmware teams, like inside these companies, they don't even talk to each other. Um, because I was talking to like a firmware hacker and they were like, yeah, sometimes when I find bugs, they're like, can you tell that team to do that? And it's like, at, a, at the same company, like the hacker is the one having to be the middleman in the communication, like that's not great. So, super bad. Um, running like any sort of server at scale with proprietary firmware is like super hard because of the problem that I said with like you don't know if the bug is you or the firmware. Um, if you turn on like uh, correctable errors, like sometimes things will just shut down and you're like, what happened? And then you don't know. Um, so a lot of this is just like crazy logic that we don't know what's happening in the computer. And when anything goes wrong and you've checked all your bases, you just want to be like, it's the firmware. So not transparent, it's bad, it's terrible. That's my whole spiel. Um, so like right now, what's kind of cool is there's like this whole like open source firmware movement. And um, they have like a bunch of cool stuff that they're working on. And since like Intel and ARM and like all the major chip providers still have proprietary firmware, they wrap this like binary blob that provides all the chip vendor stuff. And um, at first it was like this defined interface and now it seems like all the vendors are just like shoving in more logic and it's like, just stop doing that. Can you just like boot? Um, that's all anyone cares about. Or just like let us handle the boot even. But it is still cool that there is like a bunch of tooling around open source firmware. But with like Risk Five, like we don't have to deal with like that proprietary vendor bullshit. Like you can actually build the firmware like from the base yourself, which is awesome. So uh, Mirage OS Unikernels, uh, they have been working on using like running this on the bare metal as firmware. Like that's actually super freaking cool because like Unikernels, you get this like super super minimal abstraction, and you're building you know, custom kernels just for what you need. So the, like, firmware is kind of like the perfect use case for unikernels. Um, so that's like super awesome to see. Then as far as like the Linux ecosystem, you have like core boot and Linux boot. Um, Linux boot like uses Linux versus UEFI uh, for booting, which is really cool. Core boot was like the OG, you know, um, open source firmware. And then there's UB, U-Boot and UBMC, which are both written in Go um, from Google, and that's like super cool. U-Boot uses gRPC um, to do communication, which is cool, um, or UBMC does that. And then there's OpenBMC, which is a project that's written in like three different languages, um, so I kind of prefer the Go one. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the state of open source firmware, and it's really cool to see that Go has a space there um, for doing things. So the state of Go on RISC-V, though, is a whole different story. And so I got like this board called the High 5 Unleashed, and it runs Linux. That's like why I got that one. Um, it's super cool. Uh, but then I was like, oh, I want to run a Go binary because like you know Go's my language. So I like went to go see what the sta status is, and I know that they had like saved the keywords like RISC-V. Um, but there's this issue on GitHub if you want to check it out. And uh, T Claus, or he's been doing like up shit ton of work and is super awesome um, and been like carrying a lot of this. Um, but it's kind of in a disarray. So um, this repo works. Um, it's under risk five. But the problem is this repo is like, as you can see, quite old. So it's on a very old version of Go. So then I was like, oh, I'm going to update it to like the latest. Like, no. Um, <laughs> there have been a lot of changes in the compiler. Um, so that didn't work. Um, this guy, T. Clauser, like he's he's working on it, um, but there's just been so many changes that it, it, it doesn't compile. But you can use, of course, the thing from a few years ago. 
Um, so then I was like asking on Twitter, I'm like, oh, I'm trying to compile this thing. Um, and so one of the people on the compiler team was like, oh, sorry, like we changed some stuff in the con compiler. And I was like, oh yeah, like no shit, like it totally does not work. Um, so it would be really nice if this could be figured out. Um, <laughs> and I've been like trying to look into it, but it's also like, I do not have the context of the entire Go compiler, and I don't have the context of like everything else that's been going on with the changes, so, or the original patches. So I'd have to like get both contexts. So it would be nice if someone who had at least one context could maybe help. Um, so it is cool that you can like, you know, uh, use it with the old version of Go, and I would show a demo of that, but since Linux on the desktop has failed me today, I'm very sad about it. Um, you'll have to believe me. So, or you can find me after and I'll show you just on my laptop. So also the future of like RISC-V or just like anything. Um, what's cool is like you can also use like Rust to just like boot on bare metal into RISC-V uh, because Rust I started looking into, they have this thing called libcore. And so you don't actually need like an OS layer to run, run like on the bare metal, which is like super cool. And that's kind of how tiny Go is. So you can do like embedded Go. So it would be cool if TinyGo also got support for RISC-V. Um, that is basically what I wanted to say. Um, you can find me after if you have questions, but I would love to see like any of these things happen. And I think it would be like great for, you know, the future of open source instruction sets and also open source firmware.